really about uh, different types of things. So the first is infinite limits, infinite parameter limits of neural networks, uh, different types of limits. And then the second part is basically how fast you converge to those limits, so scaling laws. And so we live in this kind of era where people just keep training larger and larger transformers. Performance seems to get better and better as a function of compute. Um, you could, in this plot, I mean, so this is from the GPT-4 technical report from OpenAI. They're a little cagey about exact details, but what they're basically trying to get um, conveyed in this plot is basically they can train a lot of small models uh, for some number of steps. Look at the loss, so the cross entropy loss for next token prediction. That's a function of the, the model size. And then they can say, okay, when I run a model at this much larger model size, I can predict ahead of time uh, to very high accuracy what the performance of this model is going to be. Um, so this is a really interesting kind of phenomenon. It's very robust across different settings. You, there are scaling laws in computer vision and language modeling. Um, when I look at a plot like this, I, I kind of wonder, like one, one thing I, I'm curious about is, can I characterize, you know, what does training look like if I really took the infinite parameter limit, if I really like made the model as big as possible? Uh, is this approaching something? Uh, and if it is approaching it, how fast is it approaching it? So what sets or determines the power law that we often observe in these scaling laws? So if I looked at uh, an in-parameter model, I compared it to like some uh, some limiting process. It usually converges at a rate of like n to the minus some power alpha, where alpha is something that, that depends on the, uh, the the architecture and the task and everything. So what what kind of determines these these scaling laws and what what kind of things happen in the limit? So that's the high level pitch for what we want to want to try to aspirationally uh, discuss. And so today I'm going to basically describe a couple of different types of uh, uh, infinite parameter limits. So infinite width limits and infinite depth limits that preserve feature learning. So that's a key, uh, key, key principle that I think is important. And um, then at the end, we're going to try to basically work on a model that uh, in some simple settings capture these, these scaling law convergence rates. OK, so that's the, the high level thing. So what is a neural network? So the simplest neural network is just a multi-layer perceptron where you, you, know, you, you take your data x, you pass it through a bunch of hidden layers. There are some trainable weights between the, the data and the, the first hidden layer. And then every other hidden layer, I go through a nonlinear activation function. So I'm calling that phi. And then I go through another linear layer. There's a factor of 1 over squared of the number of terms that I'm summing. That's so that the variance and initialization of all these variables is order 1 with respect to the, the model size. So if I, you know, if I randomly initialize all these weights, I want everything to remain stable in the forward pass. Um, and in the last layer, I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to downscale the output by a factor of uh, gamma. And this is going to be um, important and to distinguish two different types of limits that we can have as n goes to infinity. So the game is I want to characterize what happens when I initialize all these weights uh, randomly and then do some gradient-based learning. So that's that's the setting. Um, and the scale factor gamma, I, I mentioned it was important. It's going to control how much the internal hidden layers of the model update during, during gradient descent. So if this is a constant and I take weights to infinity, this is known as the neural tangent kernel kind of parameterization. This will converge to a, a limit where the entire neural network behaves as a linear model. And all of the none of the neurons change their, their tuning properties. None of the representations uh, change significantly in the hidden layers. But there's another scaling, which is I, uh, I scale this factor gamma like square root of n times a constant as n goes to infinity. And in that limit, everything every, every hidden layer sort of contributes uh, some non-negligible amount of feature learning to the, to the dynamics. As, so when I train with gradient descent, if I looked at the representational geometry in the hidden layer, things change noticeably. So let's do a simple experiment to just kind of distinguish between these regimes. Like, do these things actually behave differently if I like train a network on, on real data? So let's just take like a you know, simple you know, depth 12 ResNet. Let's just train it for a couple of, there's a couple of passes over you know, CFAR 10, which is with SGD. I'm going to start with a 64 channel model. So this is the channels count as basically my width. And then I'm going to first scale it up with this NTK parameterization. So that's treating this, this gamma parameter as a constant. And so you can see as, as I increase gamma, it's sort of the training is becoming slower and slower. And like, why is this happening? Well, none of the representations in the hidden layers are changing, right? As I go to the limit. In this 64 parameter, in this width 64 model, the, the features are moving by like a factor of 1 over square root of 64. But in this model, they're moving by a factor of 1 over square root of 1024. So the training is basically slower. But my other, my other argument is if, 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 if I instead looked at this mean field parameterization where I scaled this parameter like square root of n times a constant, uh, you can see that the models really like, like quickly kind of converge to some limiting process, right? And if anything, the performance is slightly better uh, as I make the model wider and wider. Okay, so because basically I think this, this I mean, in, in a lot of experiments we've, we've done, and I'm going to share some later in the talk, um, convergence to this limit is much faster than convergence to the NTK limit. 
So the claim is that basically this limit is a better proxy for what finite width networks are doing. So if I wanted to characterize what a, what a finite width neural network is doing, I should first try characterizing what's happening in infinite width um, in this feature learning parameterization, in this parameterization that admits a feature learning limit. Okay, so that's the proposal. So what's the strategy? So we want to find the limit. Uh, we, could, we could look at infinite width or infinite depth limits with this scaling. And um, basically the story is going to be when I randomly initialize the network, uh, in this kind of parameterization. Um, so all the weights of time zero are random, and then I subsequently run gradient descent. There's a, a simple dynamical mean field theory kind of description of what's happening. Um, so the, the story is something like this. You have a system where at finite, uh, finite width, so at finite model size, you have a bunch of neurons and they're all kind of interacting in this complicated way, and they all depend on the initial conditions, the initial you know, weight matrices in some very complicated way. But as I take the limit, all the neurons kind of become independent and they only couple to each other through macroscopic sort of deterministic population averages. So what are these population averages? They'll be basically feature kernels uh, through time, through training in every layer. Okay, so that's that's the story of what happens in the limit. And basically we're gonna give a couple examples of these, these kind of- Is there something special about square root 10 or is it possible that there is a better? Ah, so this is the only, yeah. So there's, there's basically a lot of other powers that you could choose between uh, constant and square root of n. All of those between a constant square root of n will be, they'll give you a lazy limit. They'll give you a kernel limit. This is the only one that is stable that maintains feature learning. So, so if you go beyond this, things will blow up. The features will move too quickly. So that's optimal. Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's right at this, this edge of being stable, right? So, so, so anything beyond this, it would be unstable. Anything less than this, it would be a kernel limit. Um, good question. Any other questions at this point? OK. Uh, so then the, the second the second part of the talk is going to be can we explain how quickly you approach this limit? So as I make you know uh, the model size and the parameter count bigger and bigger, how, how fast do I kind of converge? And we're going to basically look at a simple you know model of neural scaling laws where we think about training dynamics. So there's going to be some budget of uh, training time, model size, and um, maybe total data, and we're going to try to figure out like what properties of the what properties of the initial kernels, what properties of the data determine how to optimally choose model sizes and training times. And um, yeah, the three resources are training time, model size, and total data. Yeah, OK. So um, let's start with some kind of loss function. So I have a loss function on a bunch of individual data points, um, but it's an average over some p of x. This is what I'm going to ask my neural network to optimize. So p of x, if I have finite, finite data and I'm repeating all my data, then p of x could just be like, you know, uh, a direct, like, like an atomic distribution on these, these P data points, these P training points, or if I'm doing like small learning rate online training, I can think of P of X as the test like population distribution, the actual you know, the distribution where all the, the data are sampled IID from. And then um, basically let's, let's start from this random initialization and then train with gradient flow. So you can show that the predictor basically, so my, my F of X, so my output of my model on data, data X at time T, it's, its dynamics are governed by some time varying kernel K that carries a time index and some error signal delta that's just it's just basically a derivative of the loss with respect to F. And this, this object basically is the sum of parameter gradients. Uh, so it's an inner product over all the parameters and it's comparing what is the gradient uh, at data point X at time T and what's the gradient at data point X prime at time, time T. And so if I knew this K function, I could integrate this equation and I'd know what the model was going to predict. So if I knew how k changes through time, uh, I would know I would know basically what, what what my neural network is doing. The problem is I don't have a good theory for how k changes through time. So that's 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 what we're going to try to figure out. Just to make a question. So when yeah. you say the NTK, you don't necessarily mean the frozen kernel limit. You're even using this here, cutting from this derivation. And, 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 right? Exactly. Yeah. So this this is uh, completely. This is all I've done is write down gradient flow in a fancy way. It, it's an aspect to your. Yeah, yeah. So this is always true. And if you if you took a different limit, then you could have k frozen. But in the limit, we're going to consider k is going to move by order of one as function form. Yeah. Good question. Um, so okay, so we have this kind of gradient flow equation. And there, by the way, there's there's a discrete time version of all of this. I just like the gradient flow thing because it clearly kind of connects to the, the lazy limit uh, through this NTK object. Um, so you could you could you could break this kernel down into contributions from each layer. So you can basically take this kernel in an MLP and it would look like uh, for each layer, there's basically an object G and an object phi. So this phi thing is, this, this G is basically a kernel for these gradient fields. So it, it, this is what I'd get if I did back propagation. So I have my output of my model and I ask, 
how sensitive is the output of my model to the pre-activation H at some, some hidden layer L. Um, so, so these kernels are basically uh, kernels for each layer. So they have a layer index. They have two uh, data indexes. And in, in principle, for the theory we're going to derive, they're going to have two time indices. So there's going to be a feature kernel at data point x at time t, another one at x prime at time s, and a similar thing for this, this gradient gradient inner product. OK? So you know, if I introduced this gamma parameter, and if gamma is 0, which was this scale-free like order 1 number that I could, I could manipulate, even in the limit. If I put that to zero, it'll keep this, this k constant through time. So this is exactly what uh, was just asked about. In that limit, if this k is constant in time, then I have basically this nice linear dynamical system. So if I know what k looks like in initialization, I can like solve really easily for what that is doing. Um, but there's a problem, and one problem with this is it's boiling down to basically a linear model. So I, I have this complicated neural network. I initialized it. I was going to, in principle, let it learn features. But in this, in this uh, scaling, it ended up just keeping all the representations the same. Uh, so what would happen if I turned off gamma zero? So if I uh, allowed it to um, be non-zero and let the kernels sort of evolve. So this would be the kind of rich regime of training. So, OK, so what happens in the rich regime? So basically, I have this recursion for the pre-activations in layer L plus 1 in terms of the pre-activations in layer L. So I can just basically expand the weights. There's a weight contribution from initialization. So that's this n by n matrix W0. And then there's all the updates. This basically comes from all the updates to the weights up till time t. So that's this integrated history of all the updates. And this, this depends on, obviously, the features, not in the features. So it depends on this feature kernel. It depends on all the error signals I've seen and also the backpropagated gradients for all times less than this. OK, and I want to do some kind of description of this model. Uh, oh, yeah, OK, also, so there's this backpropagation equation as well for the gradient signals. So there's an analogous equation for the Gs. Okay, so this is all this is all exact. I haven't done anything, um, but what we need to do is figure out what happens if I sort of randomly initialize these weights. So I want to think about this this n by n matrix as a random Gaussian matrix and try to calculate what kind of thing I'm I'm, I'm getting. So what's the description of this h vectors and these these feature kernels at, at large n? So you can use basically a kind of uh, what's known as a martin sigia rose kind of path integral dynamical mean field theory kind of argument to derive this limit, or you could use a simple kind of like cavity L argument. Um, but in either case, the story is basically, uh, at the end of the thing, each entry of this vector obeys, is a draw from some kind of marginal distribution that's determined by a single site stochastic process. So it's a random variable. And the distribution of the random variable is determined sort of only by these collective variables, these phi's and these deltas. So one other way to say it is any population average, so anything that depends on the empirical measure of, let's say, pre-activations in a layer, these things will converge. So anything that's sort of an average of, over all the neurons is going to be some deterministic thing. And then each neuron is going to behave independently conditional on all these averages, so conditional on the measure. So that's, that's the idea. Um, so yeah, so in, as n goes to infinity, the, the feature kernels and the gradient kernels are going to be non-random and initialization independent. And each neuron is going to be an ID draw from this single site process. So I have this joint distribution <laughs> on these n-dimensional vectors h, and these factorize over the sites. So they factorize over the neurons. And that's I'm plotting here different snapshots of time of training in a relevant network. And you can see that there's there's a, a good match between the theory and experiment for, for what these single site densities look like. I'll write an equation for how to sample these in a second, but it's it's you can see it's really complicated and non-Gaussian and weird. But every neuron is sort of like a marginal, like a, a draw from this marginal, basically. And the correlation functions are just single site averages over these things. So if I knew this density, then I could do averages over this density, this joint density on all the data points, and I could compute the kernels. So that, that's the game. Uh, how do I do that? So empirical averages, right, converge to these averages like this. So that's 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 the login. OK, so um, how do you solve these self-consistent equations, or what do they kind of look like? So the pre-activation, so, each, so I've, dro I've dropped the i index, right? So now this is, I'm thinking about each neuron as a random variable. Um, that's i d from this, this, this marginal. What is, what is the statistics of this thing? Well, it has one component that looks like a Gaussian process. So if you've seen these neural network Gaussian process theories or these theories that involve uh, like neural tangent kernels that have these Gaussian source terms, that's this term. And then there's an order gamma zero term that basically ca captures all of the feature learning. Um, and it depends on the gradient history. It depends on all the feature kernels up to this time and on these extra response functions. But the point is, OK, so these objects that appear here, these become deterministic, but they're determined by averages over all these, these stochastic processes. So you'd have to solve these sort of self-consistently 
uh, where you, you start with maybe a guess for all these kernels, you integrate this equation, you get samples for H, and then you do averages over H to get the kernels again. So that's, that's the idea. And there's basically two kinds of things. There's, there's correlation functions and response functions. So this is a general, general thing that we see in DMFT kind of calculations. And what's interesting is this actually in discrete time with like one sample SGD, it recovers the exact equations that were written it, in the tensor programs formalism with Yang and Hu in uh, this paper. And in a two layer network, you can recover a PDE for the pre-activations that is analogous to the main Montanari PDE for mean field models um, in parameter space. So, so this connects to basically other limits where feature learning are, um, ha ha has been studied. So this formalism kind of connects to existing things. So yeah. So in that one term for A, it seems like you have gamma not inverse. So if you're in the lazy mode, does that mean that then your response function is going to blow up? No, so this actually ensures that, the, so this object is actually ordered gamma zero. So this thing kills that. And that lets me like pull out a gamma zero here. Yeah, yeah so that's good. Um, another one. Yeah, it was a slide or two back, but the, this statement that it's IID from the single site process, this is only at infinite n? It's only at infinite n. Yeah, so at finite n, there's correlate, there, there's in principle cross correlations. Um, so and we tried, yes, sir. No, no, it's, that, that, that's good. And that's, that's what you and Cheng has showed in 22, I guess. Yes, and we have a follow up on finite and effects around this theory. So, so you could say I keep this gamma zero order one, but I tried calculating what are the cross correlations of neurons or the, the variance of these. So these, these kernels don't perfectly concentrate, they have some noise from the initialization. So you can try tracking the dynamics of that noise. Yeah, just to make sure I understand, because you, as you already pointed out, the NGK in this context is general, and you could have said just take a ton of neural networks and empirically track it, but it's very costly. And you guys are proposing tracking this single site um, stochastic process via this DMFT and the feature kernels as training happens. Is that the proposal? Exactly, yeah. So so, so I'm going to show a simulation where we try basically simulating this DMFT and comparing it to training finite but wide sort of neural networks and seeing how, how, how closely they agree. Um, okay. So let's, yeah, let's try that. So what I'm doing here is the dashed black lines are exactly trying to simulate this, this DMFT. So sampling from this stochastic process, solving the self-consistent equations, and basically getting a prediction for like how the loss is evolving. Whereas the solid lines are training like a width 1000 kind of neural network. Um, and there's an initial Gaussian kind of density for these pre-activations. And then after training, you can see that the, the densities have changed a bit. Um, but I mean, more interesting, I think, is the kernels. So you can basically get a prediction for like after training for however many steps, 100 steps. Um, each hidden layer, I get a prediction for what the final kernel looks like. Um, and it agrees pretty well with the, uh, the experiment. And you can also see the time dynamics. So if I looked at the trace, so the sample sample sum, and just looked at the dynamics of time by time matrices, you can, you can see that the theory is also quite like capturing the, the dynamics quite well. And so this, this is plotting a cosine similarity between my like DMFT solver and basically like neural networks of width n. So as n is going to infinity, right? The, this is going to <laughs> one. So the prediction is actually like converging to the, or the, okay, right, another way to say it, the finite n networks are converging to this infinite limit that I'm computing with this uh, Monte Carlo procedure. Okay, so, and then similarly, yeah, you can look at the gradient kernels as well. So this is the backward pass variables. Um, so we talked about this gamma zero parameter, right? So if this is rich, then you can sort of give them a little bit of an acceleration in training. You get really kind of interesting non-Gaussian single site distributions. Um, and, uh, but as you, as you sort of go to the lazy limit, you recover even after training pretty Gaussian looking things. So, so there's a way even within this family of theories to take this order one parameter gamma zero to interpolate between like lazy and rich regimes. That's all I'm trying to show here. And you can see that the kernel looks more or less like what it looked like in initialization for this blue guy. But for this uh, really rich thing, it sort of picked up this, it, it did this clustering. So there, was, there were two classes. Now after training, like all the points in this class have high similarity and all these points have high similarity within class, but between the class it's low. So there's some, some interesting clustering by class. Okay, fine. So linear networks, these close exactly. You don't need Monte Carlo, just because even in the feature learning regime, you maintain Gaussianity. So you can solve this really efficiently. These are just sort of integral equations. Um, that close for all these H's and G's. Um, and for certain results, so if you take this parameter to infinity, this infinite feature learning limit, it's like the zero initialization scale limit uh, that was studied in linear networks by Andrew Sachs uh, and colleagues uh, in earlier work. So that's kind of nice. It connects to existing stuff. Okay, what about large depth? So we just talked about width limits, but practitioners are also scaling you know, depth, width, 
there, there are a lot of ways of taking you know neural networks to infinity. Um, sometimes you know models even have like hundreds of layers. So this is just kind of a motivation uh, for thinking about maybe some kind of limit. Um, can we characterize some kind of training dynamics as in, in the limit of infinite depth? So, and so this is one goal. And another goal is, could I find a model or a way or a parameterization to get hyperparameter transfer? So this is the idea that I identify learning rates in a small model or like hyperparameters in a small model. And then those same hyperparameters should, should still work or still give me stable dynamics in a much larger model. So that would be a really nice property for a parameterization to have. So for general models, like for general just feed forward networks, I don't think we know how to do infinite depth limits. But for ResNets, um, we and some other people have recently kind of developed uh, ways of thinking about uh, the limits you get or parameterize how to parameterize infinite depth ResNets. So this is a work with Lorenzo, Mufan, Boris, and Jengis. And uh, there was a complementary study by Greg Gang and colleagues that came out around the same time. OK, so what is the large depth limit? So let's look at basically the solution is to look at residual networks. And we're going to scale the branches. So a residual network is a network where there's a skip connection. So the preactivations in layer like L plus 1 are exactly the preactivations in layer L plus basically something that I'm learning. So this, this, these weights are trainable, but this is sort of fixed. And in some, normally, this would just be like uh, there wouldn't be a factor of L here. But I've introduced this factor of 1 over square root of L. So let's, and, and OK, the claim is basically all those things I just told you about, uh, about the infinite width limit. So the concentration of kernels, the concentration of the network predictor, um, everything closing as this kind of single site picture. All of that still holds if you take an infinite depth limit, uh, infinite width and infinite depth limit here. And the limits in N and L commute. So that's also a nice thing. Um, but to get some intuition, let's first just look at a very simple calculation. So let's just track basically, let's say I have one, let's just track one data point. Let's track the variance of the preactivation vector on this one data point. So let's call that capital H. And that's, let's say the, so this is this average over neurons and H squared. OK, so the average entries in this vector. So this thing has a recursion, right, an initialization. So let's just look at initialization. So when these Ws are random weights, I should basically get that the, the feature variance of L plus 1 is the feature variance of L plus this kind of 1 over L correction that depends on the feature kernel at L. OK, so you can see that this, this has a feel of like a, a, discreti like a, a discretization kind of, of a underlying ODE, right? If I thought of L as doing discrete increments in some, uh, some time variable, then you could say, okay, maybe there's an ODE that this converges to in a dimensionless time that is sort of the layer index L over the total number of layers, which is some number between zero and one. Okay, so this thing has a limit uh, that I'll call H of tau. And basically all that happens is this finite difference will become a derivative. And then this term will become basically uh, just something evaluated at, the, at H of tau. Um, and so then how do I get the full NTK? The NTK rate was the sum over all the layers. Or in this case, because I have the one over real, it's an average over all the layers. This average will converge to an integral over this layer time from 0 to 1. So when you plot, so let's just look at this kernel and initialization. So this is the kernel as a function of the angular difference of two data points. So I have two data points, let's say, on the sphere. They have a difference by an angle theta. So at small depth, this like a depth 4 model has this kernel. But as I crank up depth, I'm actually going to converge to this small well-defined limit, which is just basically the, the, the limiting integral uh, that I would get as I take L to infinity. Okay, so that's nice. And then what about training? So I just told you about initialization. Um, so training also has a, has, a, has a nice thing. So H basically looks like some Brownian motion, some integrated Brownian motion, plus, again, a feature learning term. That is the same flavor as the feature learning term I, I talked about in the infinite width case. And you can see that now, though, that this basically a, carries a tau index, a t index, and, a, and an x, right? So it carries a data index, a layer time, and a training time kind of index. And all the uh, values at layer time tau depend on integrals up to tau. So that's, that's kind of the difference between this and like the, the MLP case where you just have a recursion. Um, so this Brownian motion is basically local in this layer time, but it has a covariance that's given by the feature kernel. And the kernels are still sort of defined as single side averages. So that's, that's nice. And then how is a finite depth network different than this process? The finite depth network is just an Euler discretization, basically with a step size one over L. So that's, that's the story. Um, so does this do anything useful? So here's maybe like a, a pitch for something useful. So this, this idea of hyperparameter transfer from someone Greg Yang's work is this idea that, you know, if I cranked up the depth, it would be really nice if, you know, a given learning rate that works in a small depth model also works in a large depth model. But that doesn't generally happen 
uh, in a normal network if I just set it up out of the box and try to scale up depth. So here, this, this, this learning rate uh, worked well at depth six, but actually if I use the same learning rate in depth 30, it would blow up. So all these missing dots are networks that diverge. So the optimal hyperparameters are not the same across depths. Um, but if you do this scaling trick, so if you do this one over square root of L, you'll converge to a limit as you take L to infinity. The underlying dynamics are stable. Um, you have all this interesting edge stability stuff that Alex and other people have worked on that happens. So basically there's some stabilization that happens and basically the optimal learning rate is consistent across different depths and across different widths. So that's, that's kind of nice. Um, okay, what about like, everyone's interested these days in, in transformers, right? Um, which have these intention layers as well. So there's many choices of scale, ways to scale up transformers. You know, there's number of layers, there's number of heads, and there's sort of dimensions per head. Okay. So recently with Hamza and, and Jengis, we've thought about what kinds of limits do you get in these different uh, scaling, um, these different scaling strategies. So in a normal transformer, I'm sort of alternating between like multi-head self-attention layers and MLP layers. And we're still going to do a branch scaling, but I'm going to be a little flexible. I'm going to say maybe the branch scaling could be L to the alpha. And alpha could be some number that we're going to argue about in a second. Um, and then the key thing is uh, the key difference between this and, a, uh, and just a, a normal MLP, deep, deep MLP, is that basically we have these layers that mix tokens um, called multi head self attention layers. So I'm trying to illustrate these different ways that you could take the, the attention to infinity. So you could basically take the residual stream, you chunk it up into multiple slices, and these, these we call heads. So there's a number of heads. And then there's basically this variable n, which is like the dimension per head. Okay. And I do dot products between basically keys and queries for each head. And those determine matrices known as a attention matrices. These attention matrices go into basically like a, some kind of softmax usually. So, so some, some way of turning, there's a way of turning these attention matrices into kind of distributions on tokens. And then basically I do a product of attention with some values and then I concatenate everything and I'm back to something of the original residual stream dimension. So that's, that's, that's the concatenated output. So, okay, so I could take depth to infinity, I could take the dimensions per head, or I could take the number of heads to infinity. So like, what's the right thing to do? What kind of thing do you get in these different limits? Um, so we, we, we tried working out this, doing this kind of DMFT analysis to get some insight into what kind of things happen. So one thing that I thought was really interesting and really striking was that if you took the dimension per head, right? So that's this, uh, this dimension to infinity first at fixed number of heads, you can show actually from the equations that there's a symmetry. All the heads will actually follow the same dynamics. So you have this multi-head self-attention model, but there's actually a redundant configuration. And this multi-head self-attention thing basically just boils down to single head self-attention, uh, which is sort of interesting. So if you don't believe me, you can do an experiment, right? You could measure what is the variance of the attention variables. So I have these attention matrices. What's the variance of that attention matrix across the heads of my model as a function of this, this scaling parameter n, this dimension per head. So if I use a parameterization like the one over n scaling that actually uh, gives a well-defined feature learning limit, which is, I think, introduced by Greg Gang's like tensor program stuff, as you take n to infinity, the variance across the heads is sort of decaying like one over n squared. So that seems bad, right? Because it seems like I could have just used one head in my attention model instead of multiple. Wait, so uh, yeah. uh, how does n relate to the, the embedding dimension? Because, because uh, you know, in, in, conventionally, right, like h times n is d model. Is d model, right? Yeah. So, so are, are you scaling up d model simultaneously? So, d, so, so uh, here d model is so. So I'm keeping heads fixed and scaling n, which would scale up d model. Keeping heads fixed and scaling. So, so there's two ways. Of, basically, my point with this notation is that there's two ways to scale up d model. Yeah. And they give you different types of limits. So that's why we introduce. I think it's more natural to say like. N and H, because there's an N limited in H. Oh, that's really interesting. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying yeah. like like making D model infinite while keeping only you know 100 attention heads actually cuts to one attention. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 what we were trying to argue. And um, okay, but then there's this other limit, which is you keep N fixed. You take D model to infinity by making the number of heads go to infinity. So here, what you get in the limit is actually a distribution over attention variables. So there's actually a stable distribution over attention matrices that you converge to. So here I'm just plotting after some training uh, across different numbers of heads that there's sort of some stable uh, probability density of the entries of these matrices A. So that's that's nice. And you can also verify that, yeah, as I take D model to infinity by taking heads large instead of N large, I still am converging to some kind of like uh, some approximation of the infinite width residual kernel. 
So that's that's nice. Okay, so and this is more evidence, right? So just things should get better as a function of the scaling parameter once you once you've scaled things properly. So you know, if I just train a little bit on you know CPAR five in different numbers of heads, uh, you can see that my model sort of monotonically kind of improving as I increase the, the head count here. And you can also measure just like, you can measure, I look at the neural network function on some test points, some held out test points, and I ask, is this function actually learning the same thing? Is it converging to some limit? So you try approximating the best you can, some, some proxy for the infinite limit. Um, and then you compare basically finite uh, numbers of heads models to this thing. And at early times, you know, just by a central limit theorem argument, you should be converging at like one over the number of heads. But if you train long enough, eventually the convergence rate changes right, uh, to some other heads to some other power. So we're going to go after this in a minute. This is related to scaling loss. So but check in. Yeah. 28 heads is a lot of heads. What, what, what's the model? Is, is this is just a vision transformer. So I guess here in was like uh, eight or something. So it'd be eight times 24. Yeah. So. Oh, OK. Right, so, so, so do you think that the, the right limit is to take n to be 1? I'm not sure. No, I, I, well, so OK. This like is a good question. Is I don't, small. is basically 1. 8 is small. Well, yeah. So I mean, also, the question of whether you need attention to do uh, you know, an image classification problem is also. Uh, but it, it's a good question. I actually don't know what's like the right. Uh, like, is there a certain like cutoff? Like, do you need a certain value of n to do well? And like, a but, 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 but you think n should be finite? I, I, I think like you, you should start with a good model. And then you should like maybe n is like big, but then you should scale up heads when you want to do transfer, or when you want to scale up, right? But that, that sort of like 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 keep n, but then scale each. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. That's the current proposal. There, there's some people we're talking to in industry who are interested in trying out these things. So scales the why does you keep the model fixed and you just increase the number of heads? Keep the model fixed and yeah. so, but that that's sort of dividing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dividing yeah. into so yeah. you're saying um, make n smaller, make heads bigger. Yeah. Or uh, yes, yeah. But keeping the model the same. Yeah, yeah. I mean, presumably this this won't kill you because otherwise OpenAI would be doing that. But that like, that also you're not getting more parameters from that, right? You're just, huh? You're not getting any more parameters. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm saying that. I suppose I, I have so many parameters to divide. Like, uh, uh, and but you're saying if the model is really big, you want kind of finite n and lots and lots of heads, like heads proportional to the models. Okay. Right. Right. The, uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 I guess. I, 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 I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of curious how it happens if you vary n from like you know 100 to 10 to one. Yeah, it's a good. Idea. Yeah, it's, we should do an experiment. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 But but I I think the idea is generally you start with like I mean the general philosophy right is yeah. you start with something that works well and then you go up some way and I, the question is just yeah. which which what what kind of limits if you do you get if you scale in one direction making n big or head big maybe there's some joint limit that does something interesting. Yeah, that's unclear. Yeah, we basically looked at these two directions. Um, okay, and then this is depth thing. So people have asked about this recently. So, um, what power of L do you put in one of these more complicated models? So, unlike the simple example that I just worked through with the one over square root of depth scaling, these models have multiple. Ge generically, they have multiple layers in each of these blocks, right? And so, you have to be a little bit more careful about how to choose the the L exponent here. It turns out that there's many choices that'll give you um, pre-activated, like residual stream dynamics that move by order one in the large L limit, but not all of them will have the property that the weights in each layer contribute meaningfully to the feature updates. So what do I mean by that? So let's look at the one over square root of L example. So if I took the one over square root of L scaling, I would see when I train, all of the pre-activations on the residual stream would move. Okay, that's good, even if I took L to infinity. However, the, the movement of the, the key and query matrices, let's say, so some of these hidden matrices inside the blocks, these would actually freeze, right? So if I use this one over square root of L thing, um, the amount that the weights are actually moving is, is going like one over root L. But if I use instead this one over L parameterization, so, so, so more like a neural ODE kind of limit, I would instead kind of maintain some one, one consistent updates uh, in, this, in this layer. So every layer kind of contributes completely. If I use this, alpha is one. And um, what's interesting about this limit is I mean, it kills that Brownian motion term. So remember, in the infinite L limit, there was this Brownian motion contribution, and then there was this feature learning uh, kind of contribution. This term kills all the stochasticity, and it, I basically end up with an ODE at large L. Um, so that's that's kind of interesting. Whether you need this Brownian motion to do well on the task or not is, I think, also an open question. So like the impact of these things on 
as as like design choices, I think it's still pretty much sure I understand. So in the MLK, the MLK case, it's more straightforward like what type of thing happening. Yeah. But in this case, I think you're just saying you need to choose the exponents so that sort of everything is order one, or else you effectively shut off part of the architecture, part of it decays away and you scale up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So so here the analysis of check the end scaling of each individual. Exactly. So the problem here is like I could have at large an infinite L. If I use the one over square root of L parameterization, I could have just um, frozen all the key and query matrices, and I would have had the same same limit, right? Um, which seems bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you put these things in the architecture for a reason, and so you don't want them to shut off as you scale up. Right. Very right. Good. Good. Thanks. Okay, so there's some so I, I, I presented this theory and like you know I was very optimistic about it. But I, I just want to point out like solving this in practice is not practical just because um, how would I do this on a computer for like a linear network? I try to do this self consistent solution to these these crazy equations. Let's say I had key data points and t time points that I want to compute this theory on. You know, computing the lazy limit, so this what I'm calling basically like the, the static kernel limit where where the kernel doesn't update. That sort of has a cost that's like cubic in p. Right. Um, to do the full feature learning DMFT, it's cubic in samples and cubic in the number of steps that you take. So that's really bad um, because training a neural network is sort of linear in the samples, linear in the time, but you know quadratic in the width. So so you know if if uh, basically if the width is much much bigger than the product of samples and time. So if I care about super super wide networks, then my thing would be faster. But in practice, we don't really demand this. If you just do a back of the envelope calculation, right? Like do an image net or something. Uh, n is much smaller than the product of samples in time on image depth. Okay, so this is not something that you would replace, uh, you know, a practical neural network with. However, there is sort of a fun thing we're working on, um, which is finding good non-parametric -mar non Markovian approximations to this, this theory that close without any Monte Carlo sampling, where you could maybe run this in linear time, the number of train steps, but still maybe quadratic or cubic in the samples. So that's um, this would be competitive with maybe. It would be closer to like the, the lazy limit cost. Um, and for, for very wide networks, this would be potentially better. Um, but then, okay, so that, that's all just like practical things like would this, would this algorithm be fast, whatever. There's a theoretical thing. So we, we're saying there's this theory of limiting neural networks. Um, we take this width to infinity, but we, we, we treated the number of steps or the, the sample size as sort of fixed. Um, what does finite in effect, uh, what, what do finite in effects do basically if I keep feature learning constant? So like, how does the finite in um, manifest itself in the, the performance of my model? So why do we get scaling loss, basically, is the question. So we try to look at this in two ways. We first do some kind of empirical uh, just studies of you know, training models in these parameterizations and looking at whether they, you know, how quickly do they converge to their limits. And then we do a, we have a follow-up kind of theoretical study of just an even simpler model that sort of recovers some, some qualitative aspects of neural scaling loss. So I'll try to present um, first the empirics. So this is with Nikhil, Alex, Depin, Saab, and Genghis. Um, this was at NeurIPS last year. And basically, we just tried training a bunch of models in these parameterizations that admit feature learning infinite limits. So here I'm varying the number of channels of a number of channels of a CNN on this uh, image classification task in the CFAR5M data set. And you can see that this, this thing basically, even at width 32, it's a very good proxy for the width 512 number. So this isn't like complete evidence that you could, you know, you didn't simulate the infinite curve, but basically this is evidence of like convergence, right? Um, this thing is very close to uh, some kind of some kind of limit. However, on harder tasks, or if you train a longer time on a very hard task like ImageNet, uh, the width 32 model is not a good proxy for the the width by 12 model. So there's there's kind of growing fi accumulating finite size effects as you keep training. Um, similarly, on like you know, if you do language modeling, so a transformer on Wikitext 103, right? You keep training long and long, longer and longer, and the finite size effects kind of build up over time. Okay, so this is this is our general finding. So I'd say basically, you know, if I cared about modeling with 32 networks, the infinite limit of uh, you know CNNs would be a really good model of that uh, for training on C45N. But the with 32 model is quite different than the maybe infinite limit of uh, image net training or the infinite limit of transformer training. So what are the finite size effects? Where do they come from? Uh, why, why, is, why is wider better? Okay. Um, but there's there's sort of more you can look at. You can actually ask, like, are the representations inside the network kind of converging? So uh, on the CIFAR example, where this was working really well, the you know histograms really have this kind of mean field-like property. So if I plotted the distributions of these marginal distributions of reactivations, Across different widths, they basically look the same. They're Gaussian and initialization, 
They become kind of non-Gaussian after training, uh, but consistent across all the widths. So that can be, that's very consistent with the mean field theory. And more interesting, I think the, the kernels are also consistent. So if I look at the initial kernels in like, let's say the last hidden layer of the model, um, at different widths, at initialization, they all look similar. And then after training, they all look similar. So this was not the case with the NTK parameterization, right, where feature learning decays as I go to the infinite. OK, but we still have this problem. We have this problem that, like, OK, in practice, right, when I just train networks long, a long time, train very large networks, let's say with, with width n and with <clears throat> t steps, I, I, I can usually fit the loss curves quite well as a sort of approximate sum of power laws. Right? So this is the, the kind of chinchilla-like neural scaling law where you have exponents alpha and beta um, that depend on the task. So this is just showing that they depend on the task. So you can see on the CIFAR example, the n is like 0.8, uh, the n exponent is 0.8. But uh, if I do wiki text, it's a different number. If I do ImageNet, it's a different number. So what about the task? What about the architecture of setting these numbers? So we'd like to have maybe like a theory of this. Um, so yeah, so if I train a very long time, where does this sort of late time convergence uh, power law kind of come, come in? And what sets the kind of trade-off between, you know, if I wanted to be compute optimal, so if I fixed the number of computational steps that I do, so I fixed the number of flops, and I ask, like, what's the best model size to pick? What's the best amount of training steps to take at this compute budget? Um, what properties of the architecture and data set, set this trade-off? So we, we looked recently with Alex and Genghis at a very sort of simple model uh, where you can predict these kind of compute optimal scaling laws uh, just from properties of the data and architecture. So, um, we're going to start by just thinking about this uh, like a lazy limit. Um, so we're going to first think about this infinite kernel, right, in initialization. So we have this infinite kernel k infinity, uh, and we can diagonalize it. So we can try to find some eigenfunctions of this kernel. And these eigenfunctions need to be orthogonal with respect to some data density. So this is the data density I'm sampling my data from. And um, the idea is, OK, so that's the infinite model. So the infinite model would be described kind of by doing regression with these features. Um, but at finite width, I have these within sort of eigenfunctions. So I have a within kernel. That's the empirical kernel for like the finite in, uh, the in parameter model, right? But because these psi infinities are like a complete basis, I could expand basically these, these finite in uh, eigenfunctions in the basis of these infinite things. But these have these carry this coefficient A. So this, 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 a, this a matrix is these collections of coefficients. Um, and this A has to satisfy certain constraints because I want this kernel K in to approach this kernel k infinity if I take n to infinity. So, so what does that mean? Well, it means that, OK, from one initialization to another, I get a slightly different kernel. right? That, that happens in finite width neural networks. So there needs to be some randomness. Every random initialization of a within network gives me a slightly different kernel. So that's the randomness. And then there also needs to be the property that k n has to approach k infinity as n goes to infinity. So a transpose a has to approach k infinity. OK. And then I have a neural network function where I'm using basically these, these features, these psi in features. So it's like a, this is my, my student, if you like. So I have a student function that's learning with these within features. And then I have a teacher or a target function that's learning with the, the original features. So there's some fixed coefficients that are learning with these uh, original infinite features. And the reason why um, I expand this one in, in this basis is because the, the y coefficients shouldn't depend on my random draw of weights, right? It shouldn't depend on my random seed that I drew for my you know, initial you know, hybrid program. OK, so I want to track basically these residual errors, so the difference between f and y, so the difference between the student and the teacher. And these also are going to be written in terms of the psi, psi infinity with coefficients. So, so the error along each eigendirection is going to be v0, k. So but these are going to be the important numbers to track. OK, so V0K okay is the, the target weight for this, this mode minus my effective weight for my student. OK, so that's the setup. So right, so we have these residual errors. So if I knew these residual errors, I would know basically the, the, the gap between F and Y. So I'd know the test error. So OK, the game is I'm going to draw P random data points from the data distribution. OK, and that's going to give me a big matrix of data. So there's a big sample by feature kind of matrix, this, this side. Thing. And if I just did gradient flow, the gradient flow would say the error variables are evolving like a some matrix times the error variable. So it's just a linear differential equation. But I told you that A is random, and I told you psi is random, because I'm drawing random data sets. So I have two kind of random matrices sandwiched together. Okay, so And then the test loss is going to be this linear combination of the v, VKs. So if I could calculate the VKs on average, or the square of the VKs on average over this draws of this random matrix, then it would uh, give me the test error. Okay, And this is equivalent to sort of thinking about a structured random feature model where the random projections are these A's. 
And so, you know, there's been many works using structured random feature models to think about scaling behaviors. Often they're thinking about statics. So often they're thinking about, I train a model to convergence and I think about the performance as a function of data and n. But now we have this third thing, which is tracking basically how do these finite and finite p effects propagate through gradient flow time. Okay, but the key insight you can already see from this equation, right? I have these two terms, right? As p goes to infinity, this matrix converges to the population kind of average, uh, which is just this, the diagonal matrix with all the eigenvalues. It's a limiting kernel. This thing at large n converges to the identity, but at finite n and finite p, there's potentially null spaces in these, these matrices, right? So if there's null spaces in this, this whole matrix, <laughs> It limits, there's some directions where when I act this matrix on V, it doesn't, it gives me zero. Right? Which means there's some directions where I'm not making any progress and gradient flow is basically stuck. So the low rank projections, right? When these things are low rank, it's going to limit my asymptotic kind of performance. You can already just see this from this equation before doing any averaging. Um, so yeah, so in principle, there's going to be the finite time, finite data, or finite model size effects that can limit your performance. So if you do random matrices, okay, well, first, first a couple things. What's a good model for my, my eigenvalues? If you just diagonalize NTKs, right, in initialization, you'll often see power laws. So these are for MLP is on with data on the sphere with different nonlinearities. So a bunch of different power laws. And then this is a CNN on like you know, natural images, so also a power law. So power laws are a good idea. So if you do this analysis of, so you can do an ex exact asymptotic analysis of this model uh, and get an answer in terms of the spectrum and these target weights. If you plug in the answer, for power laws, so if you assert, okay, I have power laws for my eigenvalues, power laws for my task, then you get power laws out for uh, your scaling laws. So you have a limiting power law for the training time with an exponent that's given by this t to the minus a minus one over b. And then you also have a limiting value that depends on n. So if I, I find it in, if I train long enough, there's gonna be this null space effect. There's gonna be some directions where I don't make progress. The error that I end up with is actually a power law in n. And similarly with data. So if I have finite data, there's going to be uh, a rank bottleneck that will limit my performance. And you can compute basically the, the scaling exponents associated with each of these uh, with each of these effects, these three things. Okay. And so in, in intuition, it basically the gradient descent is capturing the minimum roughly of these three uh, numbers, so t to the one over b, n, or p, sort of number of modes. And so you, you learn basically this many spectral components, and the other ones you don't learn. Okay. Um, you can also do compute optimal scaling. So you can make curves like this, which I think are kind of cool. So these are a bunch of curves of, I'm plotting compute on the x-axis. So this is product of like uh, time and model size. And then each curve is a different model size as a function of time. And you can see there's a, there's a choice that's like, how should I optimally choose at a given compute value the best uh, choice for n and t? And then that, that thing follows a power law in compute that you, with an exponent you can calculate. So that's kind of fun. And you can see basically like one, one takeaway is compute optimality is um, the, the compute optimal choices for how many steps to take or how many uh, model parameters to choose is sort of set by uh, the rate of decay of these, um, these eigenvalues. So that's kind of nice. And you prefer more training time if the spectrum is basically decaying really, really rapidly. So that's really cool. Okay, so this thing, it seems nice, but it fails. It fails because it's feature learning, right? So I started with this gamma zero to zero limit, right? This is a bunch of CNNs trained on C45M. If I explicitly linearize them, it does okay. But you can see it's a really, really bad scaling exponent. It's really slow learning. But if I allow for feature learning, I'm, I'm on this other frontier, right? So we'd like to understand that regime. So, okay, so can you extend this model? A bit? So what were we just looking at? We were just looking at basically kind of a random feature model. You take your features, you project through A, you train this last thing. Okay. What's the dumbest kind of extension that maintains a lot of the phenomenology? It's basically, you randomly project, you train a projection between here and here, and then you also train this output. So you allow for linear recombinations of the existing features. You don't allow yourself to see all the original features out here, but you train basically a, more or less a two-layer network. Okay. So I, I won't go into soon, uh, too much detail. This, is, this should be up soon in the next couple of days, but basically you can do, redo this analysis for this model where you're training multiple layers, allowing the features to kind of adapt. And if you plug in power laws, I'm, apologies, it's a different paper, so we have different uh, notation. But yeah, these alphas and betas are still summary statistics about the exponent decays. Basically, if your task is easy, so if it's efficiently easy in the sense that the target coefficients decay sufficiently rapidly, then even if you turn on this feature learning, it has no effect on the asymptotic scaling. So it reduces by like a constant factor, basically, the asymptotic loss. 
but it doesn't change the exponent. But if you are sufficiently, if your task is sufficiently hard, in the in the sense that um, for the initial kernel, if the task is outside of the Hilbert space, if it's outside of the RKHS of the initial kernel, um, then the exponent uh, when you do feature learning is roughly double the exponent when you are just lazy. So an easier and hard task, but we don't use them. Yeah, so I'll have I'll have some examples. Those are both hard, actually. Uh, so so you can measure beta by looking at the spectrum for the kernel and initialization. For a lot of real data, it's all, often less than one. So I think we're actually living in this world. Do you keep saying that about the RKHS? Yeah, exactly. So if beta is bigger than one, RKHS norm is finite for the target function. So the target function is in the RKHS of the limiting kernel. Okay. If the task is if beta is less than one, the task is outside of the RKHS of the initial limiting kernel. And it's in this case that we, uh, in our toy model, see a, an improvement in the scale. Right. So, in particular, the feature learning would expect to be very bad at that point. So, it sounds like the RKHS. So, actually, so it, the lazy limit is really bad. Right. The lazy limit. Sorry. The lazy limit is very bad. Okay. The feature learning limit is still bad, but it's roughly twice as, it, it's two times better, right? So, than the really bad thing you would have had uh, had you not learned features. And this is basically the curve of how, how much better you're doing. So. This part of the curve is basically, okay, itch and lazy coincide for tasks that are, you know, within the RKHS of the initial kernel. So the exponent for the time scaling should just be uh, basically beta. But in the rich regime, I can get basically this function, uh, chi of beta, which is this red curve. So this is my predicted exponent compared to the lazy limit, which would just be beta. So I, I'm doing roughly twice as good, especially like at small beta. This is cool. Why, is there an intuitive explanation for why this happens? Yeah, let's, let's, oh, uh, okay. There is, um, I don't know if I included it, but the, 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 the toy model basically, basically what's happening is the kernel's growing in like a relevant direction, but it's growing actually like a power law. And when the kernel grows like a power law, that the, the feature learning term at law, well, so, so, okay, in this, in this setting, the kernel's sort of converging dynamically to some limiting thing. And so even though you've got an acceleration at the beginning, at late time, you're not getting any change in the power law. Here, as I train, the kernel's still evolving as a power law. Uh, but I guess the, the, it seems that the hard part is continually discovering these like lower and lower eigenmodes. So like, I, I, and as I understand in, in types of like, you know, the staircase function types of tasks, like discovering the earlier eigenmodes helps you accelerate Helps you eat more easily. It like points the way towards the other yeah, yeah. but I don't see any sort of like feedback effects you get here. So but, why, why, what, where is the acceleration? So because the RKHS form would diverge, there's sort of when you integrate the loss or when you integrate all the updates, if if the kernel was not basically the, the kernel, there's not a um, there's not a self consistent dynamics that leads to the kernel approaching a constant in this setting. The kernel has to be always growing. And oh, oh, because see. because you're outside of RKHS. Oh, so, so, so this is just kind of due to the fact that like the kernel is getting bigger and bigger, and so yeah, and it's like aligning in this direction. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, oh, oh, okay. The kernel, the kernel's like doing this task. It's like it's always sort of updating um, in this in this setting. Whereas, say, in, whereas in this setting, the kernel's stabilizing. But it, 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 but this isn't due to the kernel aligning. It's just due to the kernel growing in size. Yeah. So there's two terms. There's one that's just growth in size, and there's another that's an alignment, and they they both are growing like power laws. Do you still see this benefit if, in both cases, you take the like optimal learning rate? Yes, I mean this is robust across different choices of this gamma and different choices of learning rate. We, we can talk offline. Right. I, I, I'm okay. running out of time. Yeah. But, so you could ask, does this? Um, so this is that, those were simulations of the toy model, and that's fine. It's a toy model, and oh yeah, okay, feature learning helps in a certain regime. That's good. But does this? It would be really crazy if uh, I could look at the initial diagonalization of the infinite kernel for a nonlinear kernel. On a nonlinear task, and see if I can predict an exponent when I train online. That would be really cool. So actually, that sort of works in a surprising way. So these are a bunch of nonlinear, like relu MLPs of a certain depth, so like depth four relu MLPs. And uh, I'm trying to fit functions that are um, just you know four they have four a series with coefficients that are power law. The eigenfunctions are four a harmonics, so that's nice. So I actually I have complete control in this setting. I can completely manipulate whether a task is in the RKHS or out of the RKHS. Again, so, so for beta less than one, that's all these curves. These are all, I'm plotting the predicted new exponent, which is this two over one plus beta thing. So this, this, this multiple of the original exponent you should have had. And then I'm plotting these other curves, um, the beta, right? So basically in the, when, you're out of RK, when you're in RKHS, you just get the same scaling you would have had if you were lazy, asymptotically. Um, so that's kind of nice. 
Someone asked about like MNIST, CFAR. So MNIST, you get a beta of 0.3. So if you try diagonalizing the kernel and looking at the spectra and how fast they decay and all that, it's 0.3. So it's less than a one. So if I linearize the if I linearize the um, the the neural network model, it obeys the t to the minus beta scaling. But if I allow it to learn features, so if I crank up this feature learning parameter enough, I'll get it to actually converge to this other exponent. So this t to the minus two beta over one plus beta. So this is this is a real nonlinear network on uh, on a real uh, on an image rec on in, in, in image recognition. Set. Okay, but it's not perfect. Okay, so here's I'm going to show you a failure plot. Um, so this is yeah me, the, the original motivation for the second part was like oh it, you know the original exponent we got was 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 too pessimistic feature learning was a lot better so for some time this new exponent is somewhat descriptive but then the model eventually does something better so we don't mm -hmm. quite understand what's happening down here um, but yeah I mean the lazy theory is just really good when you explicitly linearize the model right and follow this blue curve um, and then this 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 new prediction seems predictive for some regime but then if you keep training. So we're, we don't quite understand this, but um, we think this is, you know, an improvement at least, at least in some of these settings, right? Like this setting. So, um, yeah. And so that's that's mainly it. Uh, Having to take any questions in the remaining time. But, uh, yeah. Thank you. We have time for some some questions. We have some time. Maybe I have a quick one. Does it uh, adding the second layer challenge the experiments with n and other parameters? So it, 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 it does not. Those are fixed, actually. Okay. And you can sort of see why. Um, okay. I'm sorry. Um, so my construction, right, I'm sort of saying you're allowed to do linear combinations of the existing things. But these existing things are already like projected versions. Of the of the limiting features, right? So I'm not I'm sort of preventing my model from accessing the original things. Um, if I didn't if I if I just trained this layer, then I would have no parameter bottleneck. It would be trivial. Um, so so that, that's sort of the thing. So so the parameter the parameter and data bottlenecks don't change uh, in this regime, but the um, the time dynamics. Okay. So the compute exponents change because of the time exponent, but you're comparing against still that n to the minus alpha okay. data. Yeah. Okay. So then like the scaling loss for the lazy limit, I remember you said the limiting factor was that these A matrices and these other matrices become like low rank. Is that, is that right? So there, there, there's more effects than that, but that's that's like a that's the dominant effect, yeah. Sorry. Is there like a any sense of like how one might be able to like like design your architecture in order to avoid the mean low rank? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. So, um, so you're, you're talking about this, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're about this. So you're, you're saying like, okay, uh, this is always. I mean, okay, if you have n parameters, this is always a rank n thing. Yeah. But if you can kind of get it to align in a good way, so if you do feature learning in a way that causes it to like <laughs> align to the relevant directions yeah. in the feature space, maybe that, maybe that's what's good. I mean, so, so I, mean, I know you're doing some of these experiments where you're asking the model to preserve as much information as possible, like, even under this finite rank constraint. Yeah. Um, I think that's like yeah an interesting future direction, but this is at this stage for this this analysis this was actually just a frozen, frozen random projection that is not allowed to be trained. Um, and, and like in like the feature learning case, it seems like the limiting factor is that the, some of the relevant directions you care about have like really low like eigenvalues, and so like you're not getting boosted enough from feature learning. Is there any way to like artificially boost those directions? I'm not sure if that makes sense. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so like, are there optimizers that would like precondition the updates so that I'd get also an acceleration? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. So I mean, in some sense, is this optimization effect like feature learning is like kind of doing some dynamical preconditioning effect where it's it's blowing up the effective uh, kernel to give you this acceleration? Um, but yeah, I mean, this this is this is I guess not designed. But you, you're asking like, are there other design principles that we can use to to speed this up? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a good question. To make sure I understand the big picture of the DNF stuff. Sure. Um, I understood a little bit of the stability stuff this summer in the NLP case, thanks to Jack Rhodes, so thank you. Um, and I think what you're what you're saying is that it, 
the deviations of the pre-activations uh, pre from the Gaussian initialization, you're keeping track in terms of this integral that's completely described by these uh, feature kernels or whatever you call it. And so then you have this IID site-wise pre-activation and you just keep track of the statistics of the pre-activations and you show that it converges in the limit to what you expect with BNFT, at least in the situations. Um, and that, I think what you're saying is that that sort of analysis is repeatable architecture by architecture. First of all, you do the exponent analysis and see if there is a solution that lets you scale up. That's step one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then from there, you try to see if there, you need this factorization though, to, uh, of the, of the IID factorization of the analogs, the pre-activations. Yeah, well, one way to see it is like, you can almost think about it as a conditioning step. So like conditional on the kernels taking on a particular value, none of the neurons talk to each other. Like neuron I just talks to neuron I, yeah. right? Um, so but the problem is, you have, so, so it's about basically if you can show concentration of the kernels and the, the macroscopic variables. If you can show concentration of the kernels, then you have this DMFT tree. Then you have this single site factorization. Right, right, right. Yeah. And that's the key thing. That's the key thing. That, that's, that's the key thing. And then if you, I guess your point is, if you do the DMFT right, then you should be able to show that as you scale up, it's approaching what you would have gotten. Yeah, I think that's right. And unlike, I mean, I know the lazy learning story pretty well. It's like, from a modern perspective, like bordering on the trivial derivation in comparison. But this this really is a theory of dynamics at infinite width, um, where the deviations of the Gaussian, from Gaussian, the Gaussian initialization is the key to the practical. Exactly. Yeah. One, one way to say it is this theory, you could you could think about it as being non-perturbative in this gamma zero, like feature learning richness, but perturbative in width, right? So you can do like uh, perturbation series expansions in width right, uh, around this thing, but it's it's tracking every power of gamma zero. In some sense. So so it's tracking like all the uh, so any 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 like interesting feature learning that can happen at infinite width. Could could happen in this this, this limit. Yeah. And just to make sure I understand the definition. By the, by the mean field here, you mean the single site factorization, yeah. the IID property. And then but those are it starts Gaussian and initialization, but then it becomes not Gaussian, but it still factorizes at all times. Yes, that's right. Thank you. <clears throat> um, great talk, uh, very thought provoking. I mean, honestly, if I understood the, the basic the big picture of the second part, so you do like the scaling analysis of the kernel and the spectrum, and uh, again, it's not that hard to get that to work for the MTK. And, and, and then you can move on to this uh, two layer model, where then there's a, another hard regime where the original kernel really the, doesn't get the, the, the functions you want on to the space. And so you need the feature learning, and then in some sense, uh, there's some well, second stage of learning that applies to this exponent. So, could you make a model in the task where you have three layers? Yeah, I think it would be super interesting. Like, are there uh, are there extensions that like might uh, even have accelerations in like uh, other regimes? So maybe there's another cutoff in beta where you get an even better exponent. Yeah, that's a good question. We've thought about. It. I think we have technology to, I guess, analytically try to track if you did like a deeper version of this kind of thing. Um, like a deeper version of this. So it might be worth looking into. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask one more question? Um, I asked Cheng a similar question a couple of weeks ago, and I think I'm just slow enough in understanding this stuff that I just want to ask you again. Um, so you alluded to at one point that if there is a feature learning infinite, which I think you mean if you fix an architecture, you do stability analysis, if you study these exponents, there might just not be a solution. Is, do you know of cases where there's not a solution? So yeah, if you just use standard parameterization, oh, like fixed learning rate or something, things will do. So like, there's a lot of things that will not admit a limit because something will blow up. Or, uh, because I, because I, I know in the MLP analysis, you do this analysis and you get a one parameter family and then you fix Greg's scaling that the learning rate doesn't go with that or something. And then it gives you one solution. Dimensionality of the solution space is zero, but there's exactly one solution. Do you know of any architectures where there's just not any solution whatsoever? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, Maybe I haven't looked at enough architecture. I, uh, I've, so far, it's mainly been, there's usually like a, a family of solutions. And then, yeah, as you say, if you impose a constraint, I want order one learning rate, then it's usually like one solution in all the examples we've looked at so far. Um, can, can, can you use this as like a principle for architecture design? So for what I mean by that is, when you do the stability analysis and you study the dimension of the solution space for the exponents, uh, a big solution space gives you more room to impose additional constraints, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. Um, do you know of cases where you have a pretty big solution space? I mean, I, I only know of these couple examples. So an MLP is one, and then you fix it to zero with Greg's assumption. Sure, sure. Um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. So with depth, I think there's some of these symmetries that you can play with. So there's different ways of like, <clears throat> there's different ways of choosing learning rate, pre-multiplier and weight scales. So, so I, I, I always, I like to work with weights. So I think you can, you can just by conversion choose, choose to fix one thing, right? So I like to work with all my weights having unit variance. Uh, then I have prefactors outside to do the, the normalization. Yeah, yeah. If you do that, there's like a unique answer, but in this like depth scaling thing, you could imagine absorbing some of these factors inside the layers of the weights or yeah, or and, and also changing changing the learning rate uh, scaling with, with depth. So th th there's still a family of symmetries for how to do like, for instance, depth scaling, just like with the width that you're familiar with. Thank you. Any more questions? Did you want to take a speaker again? Thank you. Sure. Yeah.